Welcome Internet to Psychologist's Casual View and today we're going to be reviewing the neurobiological underpinnings of psychoanalytic theory and therapy by Mark Solms. So in this um, article Mark Solms is going to argue that there is a link between psychoanalysis and neuroscience. A link in which he's going to basically say that both fields are not just compatible, but they do work together and they can be understood in the light of each other, i.e. neuroscience can help understand psychoanalysis and psychoanalysis can help understand neuroscience. And both shouldn't be that separate. In this way, it's in the tradition of neuropsychoanalysis, a uh, current uh, thought school, a school of thought in which basically a psychoanalysis and neurologists or neuroscientists come together to basically try and organize understanding through the lens of both psychoanalysis and neuroscience. So basically to, to achieve such a goal, um, which is very ambitious, Max Holmes is going to make three claims in the text. He's going to say, first and foremost, that the infant, the, the child that's born, isn't a blank slate. It isn't, he isn't tabula rasa, that there is something there. These needs, which are like all other species. The second claim, which is intertwined with the first, is that our whole mental apparatus, our whole mental development, is there to help us fulfill our needs, that our goal is to basically be able to understand, learn, and basically appreciate how to fulfill our needs. And the third claim is that basically um, a lot of our processes in life are unconscious and that basically meeting our emotional needs uh, are executed unconsciously and therefore it requires us to bring them back into consciousness if we are to rework them or try and modify them. So those three claims are very important because basically he argues that even though it seems um, abhorrent or aberrant for someone who has studied psychoanalysis, a lot of neuropsychologists have thought of the baby as basically a blank slate in which basically stimuli just ha so happens to uh, hit and the baby reacts to stimuli. And he says that although it's not necessarily wrong per se, it's much more subtle than that because babies come with what he calls predictions. So what are predictions? He uses it in a Friton uh, sense. Basically for Mark Soms and for Friton I suppose, basically the pred predictions are baby has a form of logic, not in this Wittgensteinian sense, but in the sense of like baby does experiences or feels that some things are going to happen if A plus B equals C, right? So baby is going to try and fulfill the needs through that lens of experience. And basically these predictions are going to um, be true or false, but in both cases they will be engrammed into the unconscious, i.e. they will be uh, they will have powerful weight within the unconscious mind. It's only with the development of consciousness that um, baby is going to forfeit what doesn't work and basically focus on what does. And he says that it's basically because there's an emotional gain when we, we succeed in something or that we see that our emotional need has been met, that we pursue in that direction. But the previous logic is not necessarily completely cancelled as it remains in the unconscious mind. So for Solms, the unconscious mind here is to be understood uh, through the terms of long-term memory and short-term memory. So it's not the unconscious is long-term and the consciousness is short-term, even though we will come back to consciousness, there is a bit of that. Long-term memory for Mark Solms and in neuroscience in general, right, is divided between declarative and non-declarative. So for the non-initiated, declarative is basically what you can remember. For example, uh, episodic memory is your autobiographical memory, right? Like, for example, when if you remember when you went for, I don't know, for a piece of cake at the Cheesecake Factory, 
you may you remember it, right? You remember with who you went, how you went, and so on and so forth, right? That's episodic, right? Now, there's also semantic. Semantic is the acquired knowledge. For example, if you know, let's say, um, where France is on the map, you know that because you've acquired that knowledge, that information, and so on and so forth. So you have those two types of long-term memories. But for sounds where the unconscious lies is in the non-declarative, i.e. what you cannot re recall. So for him, there are two main um, non-declarative memories. The first is the emotional one, i.e. we're not conscious of all our emotions at the same time. Those emotional memories are stopped and not necessarily um, there for the picking, but they're still there. For example, I might not think, for example, about something, like let's say something displease, displeasing, but it's still there, it's still in my mind. And the emotion might be repressed, as we would call it, but it can come back. Secondly, um, and perhaps more um, subtly, is what he calls a procedural memory. So in neuroscience, procedural memory is effective, for example, if you know how to, to use a bike, you might remember where you learned it, but the gestures, the is unconscious, meaning that you don't think about it. When you're riding your bike, you're not thinking every, sing every single second, I have to use my left foot, then I have to use my right foot, um, and so on and so forth. So basically, it's procedural. You know how to do it, even though you're not really conscious of how you do it. It's like lacing your shoes or things like that, right? Proce procedural memory. So for him, the, the, the patterns that get into those um, two sub-memories are basically very hard to get because they become unconscious. They're no longer reachable within the, within the, with the, the, just the consciousness, right? So what he says is that those memories have a pull towards the external world, but only through the lens of reenactment, what we would call acting out, right? For example, when a patient acts out something, because what he says is that this non-declarative memory is below the words. It, shortcut thinking to basically just act out because for him thinking is what is linked with short-term memory i.e uh, short-term memory is what you have in your consciousness right now that's the thing you can think about it that's the short term that's the consciousness it's the peak of consciousness right and we are through our whole development and civilization we have to aim at the peak of consciousness, i.e. reason, rationality, thought, and so on and so forth. But there's always that unconscious mind just basically go pushing and pushing and pushing, and it bypasses the thinking. So for him, how it works is that we as therapists, often what we do is help the patient understand those patterns that are in the non-declarative memory um, and basically we hope help the patient gain and gain again the, um, the patterns to be able to be really conscious of it aware of it and in that awareness we can change them through bringing them back in the consciousness because if they're not brought back in the consciousness they just are spiraling in versions of acting out so what he says is that consciousness it is um, an incredible um, tool that we can do a lot. However, we can do much less than our unconscious minds. Unconscious minds are less limited than our consciousnesses. For him, for Psalms, the consciousness is basically um, very bottlenecked in the fact that it's very limited. It can't do many things at the same time. It has to focus, it has to choose, it has to renounce. Whereas the unconscious mind does not have to. And he goes back to Freud on this, which for Freud, there is no contradiction in the unconscious mind. There is no notion of time. There is no um, inherent uh, blockage or things that cannot be done for everything is possible in the unconscious mind. And he says that that's not possible for our consciousnesses because they're basically they're, they're limited. So therefore, not everything is possible. And basically, the reality principle comes and reinforces that, that basically we have to renounce. But um, predictions, the false predictions I was talking about earlier, are not forsaken in the unconscious mind. They still have a lot of weight, a lot of power. And our whole aim as psychotherapists is to bring out 
that prediction, that unconscious prediction, that bias, and try and work on it, to try and make the patient realize what it is, where it came from, and why it's there. And only through the fact of getting it into the conscious mind, i.e. into the short-term memory, into the conscious memory of episodic and basically um, semantic, can we digest it, can we reshape it. So for him, and he's going to argue that there are things he disagrees with with Freud, which basically are the idea that the Nirvana principle and the pressure principle are separate. So very, very quickly. For Freud, the death drive has the aim of basically putting the individual to a state of zero-ness, i.e. without tension, absolutely fulfilled. And for Solms, this isn't the death drive. For Solms, the Nirvana principle is a perfect ideological, biological state. What does that mean? Is that biology aims to fulfill all the needs. And the perfect state is the state where all our needs are fulfilled. Therefore, he feels that the death drive is separate from the Nirvana principle. Thus, he disagrees with Freud and the assertion of Freud that the death drive aims at the Nirvana principle. So that's one disagreement. And he also disagrees that with Freud that what gets repressed, i.e. what gets pushed down in, into the unconscious, isn't uh, the representation, i.e. the images, but the emotions. Something I found very interesting because I personally tend to agree with this, that what gets repressed is often the representation, yes, but also an emotional charge. And the patients don't feel it. Uh, we would call it now dissociation, i.e. the feeling it does not uh, impact the conscious mind, but it's still there, it's still in the framework of the unconscious. And I found that to be very interesting and one which I personally agree with as a statement. Anyway, moving on. So basically for him, our whole process of learning is aimed at one and one specific thing, fulfilling our needs. We learn not because uh, we like to, so to speak, but because it's essential for us to be able to understand our needs. And for him, the affect and the needs are one, because the affects show what we really need. For example, uh, he gives this idea that fundamentally, if I feel lust, is that I want to basically reproduce. I want to have um, sexual uh, interactions. If I feel aggression, it's because I want to defend something, I want to protect myself, or I basically want to push out someone that's basically trying to hurt me, or I think, or I perceive as trying to hurt me. And the same goes for everything. So we learn in a way to be able to fulfill our needs. And he also backs Fernburn in this idea that basically our needs are intertwined with relationships, that we are not... Um, alone in this world and that basically the object i.e. the relationship with other is fundamental in our in the building of our needs and how to answer them and for Psalms when we are unable to answer our needs when we are unable to identify our needs or to put strategies to try and fulfill them then that's the start of psychopathology the psychopathology for Psalms is fundamentally a state of frustration because the needs are not met, which does also um, correspond in a certain way to Freud's idea of drives and of basically how drives function, i.e. when they're not um, fulfilled, they be basically put pressure on the conscious mind. So in that, he's in agreement with Freud. And fundamentally, he ends this article, very interestingly enough, on this idea that psychoanalysis is effective, but it also has a sleeper effect. So the sleeper effect, if you don't know what it is, is that this very interesting idea that young, basically, that even after therapy, there are still things that are gained. The patient still progresses, even though therapy is over. And he argues in this article that this is because what psychoanalysis aims for is a change of personality. That he says that a long, for a long time in neurosciences, they were misguided. They thought that the true core emotion w was in the 
frontal cortex, i.e. this part, right? And that, But he says that this was the most superficial understanding. Those things were basically what controlled uh, certain impulses, certain emotions, certain effects. But, this, this, but that went deeper, i.e. it was more in the cortex with the hippocampus, with the amygdala, with the ganglia, and the cerebellum, the, all of those things are in what he thinks the unconscious mind is. Um, and basically, what we understood was only the more superficial aspects of the mind, the um, ego, uh, but not the id. So for him, the id is more ingrained, more in-depth in the brain. It's not in the superficial layers of it. So therefore, what happens is that the sleeper effect, we create something in which the patient starts to think, analyze, feel and digest and what happens is the mind or the brain basically works through layers and the layers start to basically connect to each other and seep down and that's what we are aiming at through the prolonged exposure basically we are going deeper and deeper not just into the mind but into the brain i found that idea to be incredibly interesting and kind of fascinating that in a way, we go deeper in the mind and deeper in the brain, and that there's a form of symmetry, right? Um, and lastly and finally, he explains that basically our whole framework has to be re-understood, that basically psychoanalysis is effective and sometimes even more effective than would be CBT or other forms of treatment, and that our aim, because it's so important, i.e. it's so massive, because we try and change personality, therefore we go further, we try and sense further, therefore it tends to work more. It's in the interesting paradox of the inventor. So if you don't know, this is an interesting paradox in which the basically the higher you aim, the more results you're going to get, even though you might fail a bit more, or you might, um, the more you're ambitious, the bigger the results and because and for the, that's something that i think cannot be opposed psychoanalysis is incredibly ambitious with its project we aim very high therefore we have a lot of gains and i think that that's an interesting way of putting it and he ends up very cheekily saying that basically um therapists that choose therapy for themselves often opt for psychoanalysis or for psychodynamic rather than cbt or other form of therapy, which is something I had also read in the loam, and I think it's kind of true based on experience. I mean, I'm not saying statistically, I don't know, but I found it very interesting and something that is kind of tongue in cheek. So what did I think about this article? This article was very interesting. However, personally, your um, mileage might vary because some people are very receptive to the merger of psychoanalysis and neurosciences. Some others aren't and feel that both should be very separate. I tend to embrace the idea and aspiration I find very creative. However, I am myself very divided on the topic because sometimes it feels in neuroscience and psychoanalysis that bridges are made kind of artificially, like this whole principle of long-term emotional and procedural memory being the unconscious within the cerebellum and being in the ganglia and the amygdala. It kind of, at least for me personally, doesn't really work because I don't think of it like, like that and I don't clinically uh, understand it like that. But if it brings some answers for some people, I mean, that's what matters, right? So on the whole, and this article is very interesting and very good if you're into that point of trying to understand both psychoanalysis and neuroscience at the same time and trying to bridge the two. If you don't like that, there's nothing you're going to like about this article because you're going to feel that the, the link or the connections are tacked on or ad hoc and you might um, not enjoy it. So it depends on your perspective. But on the whole, it's quite an interesting article and if you're into that, it's well worth the read. So other thing, it's free and available, so I'll link it in the description. And if you have any questions, anything you'd like to ask, um, feel free to do so in the comments. I'll see you in the next one.